Great. Uh, wonderful to be here. A wonderful opportunity to talk to you here today, Thomas, and ask you a few questions. Now, the fantastic opportunity, hopefully, will leave us also with some parting comments about the future. Before we get there, you've spent a lot of time in the industry already, 25 years as a technologist. You've seen a lot of disruption, and we heard it just now in the video clips. Now, from a technology perspective, can you talk to us a little bit about what you've seen? You've worked a, 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 across your career with for the financial services companies. What have you seen? How is this industry perhaps different? What really stands out? And maybe, unsurprisingly, maybe talk a bit about the cloud. So, you know, financial services fundamentally, unlike other industries like retail, the product is a digital product. And as digital technology has advanced in a number of different ways, it really changes the way that financial institutions can think about creating new products, pricing them, managing risk associated with them, distributing them, and reaching customers to deliver an experience in a fundamentally new way. And as digital advances, we see that financial institutions have now got enormously capable tools at their disposal to change the kinds of products and experiences they deliver. But at the same time, there are new risks that are emerging all the time. Uh, Cybersecurity was just mentioned. That's just one example. And they have to think about how best to use these tools to both exploit opportunities and manage risk. OK, thank you for that. So how does this relate to perhaps some of the investments around the cloud? So when we look at the financial sector, we'd probably say it took a while, and then there was a, uh, an absolute flood of investments going towards the cloud. So is this what you're seeing as well when you're dealing with your customers? Yes, we see financial institutions around the world moving much more aggressively to use cloud. There was a period of time where there was anxiety about data security, locality of data, regulatory concentration risk. But as cloud companies have invested, like Google, billions and billions in data centers and software capability to protect data, to build very advanced cybersecurity capabilities and other things, I think financial institutions increasingly look at cloud as a new platform that they can use to innovate uh, and to deliver experiences in new ways and to connect their products to consumers in new ways. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that. So we'll get back to that in, in, in a moment. But maybe on a more general level, where do you see that the banking sector, the financial sector, is perhaps a little bit ahead of the curve? And are there areas where they need to do a little bit more and invest perhaps more heavily? You know, if you look broadly, we see financial institutions, some of the leading ones, using platforms in new ways, uh, like cloud platforms, in new ways to handle how they do regulatory reporting, how they do, you know, settlement activities, what they do for risk management, how they're doing mark-to-market -market accounting calculations much more quickly. Mm -hmm. And then there are others who are looking at, for example, using cloud and some of the sophisticated artificial intelligence tools to understand fraud and uh, things like anti-money laundering much, much more accurately. OK, that's great. So, so maybe let's switch a little bit. We heard uh, the open banking revolution uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, you can tell where we sit on this. You know, it is, it is reality. Now, um, it's fair to say that the use of APIs in this is very important connecting across uh, the ecosystem. And in fact, we think that in future, the future business models are mainly going to be ecosystem-based. So it'd be great to get your opinion on this, to see whether you think that it's a real opportunity. It's here to say, will we see the open banking API approach change over time? I think you know we, we generally see open banking. There's two different ways we see this API or ecosystem. The first one is to empower the consumer mm -hmm. and to put the consumer at the center and allow the consumer from their device to be able to access their financial information, whether it's from one or many different financial institutions, to get a unified view of what their financial situation looks like. I think that's enormously empowering to consumers. It simplifies and makes financial transactions much more convenient for them. And every time you make something more convenient, 
you make it more useful for them. Similarly, we see, you know, we're at this conference, and SWIFT is the ultimate example of a, an ecosystem that's brought the financial community together. We see, similarly, many financial institutions now taking their core systems, and not just at the top when they're exposing things to consumers, but also from one financial institution to another, being able to do, for example, interbank payments, cross-border payments, et cetera, through a much more efficient model. So at the heart of it, the financial system in the world is an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And the cleaner you make the ability to interconnect these things, the easier it is for consumers, the easier it is for financial institutions to do business with one another. Is this still an area that needs more investment from your perspective? Is this an area that needs to grow quicker, faster, because it just increases the ecosystem exponentially and is a real opportunity? Well, as you interconnect an ecosystem mm -hmm. and as you make things more convenient for consumers, for example, you also have to think carefully about, for example, the faster you can allow people to transact, mm -hmm. the more likely you have to have more sophisticated tools to protect against fraud and, uh, and, and other forms of malicious behavior, right? right? The, the more quickly you can move money between institutions, uh, the more you have to come up with new ways to protect against, for example, uh, people doing malicious things. And those tools are now becoming much more sophisticated. Uh, new solutions based on artificial intelligence, for example, are, are much more precise in the way that they can identify what is a potential fraudulent transaction. Rather than just depending on a set of rules, right. which, you know, frankly, bad actors always very quickly figure out by testing your rule set, what are the fraud, what are your rules, and they know how to get around it. Now you have much more dynamically evolving systems that are able to detect fraud and to keep bad actors from being able to attack an entire ecosystem. Right, it's a real benefit to everyone in the ecosystem. That's right. Okay, thank you. Now let's, let's talk a little bit more, a bit more about the cloud. Um, and so from our perspective, we see cloud maturity and how you approach it in your investments in the cloud very much aligned with your maturity along your digital transformation journey. So at the same time, what we're hearing a lot from customers is still the worry about getting locked in. There's been you know, a lot of experiences in the past where uh, a lot of companies are, are maybe a little bit shy in terms of, of putting their eggs in one basket, so to speak. So what's your perspective? Is this a viable concern still today? Are there ways around it? How should you manage it? I think you know, it's important for technology providers to address the needs of both financial institutions and regulators. Regulators worry that as cloud becomes a primary way that financial institutions run their core systems, there's sort of concentration risk. Right. And you know, financial institutions obviously worry about, based on the past history of technology providers, are they going to get on a platform that will take them many, many years to get off of? Now, as, as at Google, we believe that the more open cloud can be, uh, the easier and broader will be the adoption because people have lower risk than in using cloud providers technology. And so we've in invented something uh, that we brought to market that lets a customer build a workload once. They can run it without change in their data center. They can move it to Google or any other cloud provider. And they can manage it in a consistent way. And doing that both broadens the appeal of cloud because it allows a financial services organization to be able to train their people on one technology uh, rather than on three or four different technologies from each provider. It gives them choice and most importantly lowers risk because you manage all these environments in a single consistent way. And so for us as a technology participant, it's important that we listen to customers and regulators and evolve the technology to solve problems like this. Okay, so the world is, is it fair to say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, the world is multi-cloud? Yes. Yes, firmly. And we expect that to be really the fundamental way that most institutions think of their systems going forward. Mm -hmm. So as again, is the power of the ecosystem, the options that you have and bringing those together, and leveraging the technology Absolutely. and the innovation. Super. So how do we then deal when we go to the next step and we look at what happened, a lot of M&As, we've seen uh, some, some uh, stretching of, on, in some of the e e economics of, of uh, financial services companies. 
Um, so when we look at how people deal with their data, data is, is the new liquid gold, the new ink, whatever you want to call it. So what do you do in terms of starting your journey around really getting that intelligent core going and that digital platform that really speaks to the new ecosystem economy and all those wonderful things? So data you know, acquisitions typically lead to lots of systems. Many of those systems have private copies of data. And these data silos lead to enormous difficulties in being able to deliver no new services to your customers. It also makes things like managing risk and calculating, for example, your uh, current position from a financial point of view much more difficult because the data is fragmented in different systems. And the meaning of the data, like what's right. a customer, that's fragmented in many, many different systems. So we believe that the, the quicker that organizations rationalize the places they store data, the quicker they define common meanings to data, like what's a product, what's a customer, what's risk, et cetera, it's much easier then for them to use more advanced technology. For example, a lot of projects that people talk about with artificial intelligence, they have difficulty not because of the algorithm, but because the data itself is not clean. And generally, in software, garbage in means garbage out. And so unless you clean up the data before you feed it to the algorithm, the algorithm's not going to make much sense of the data you're feeding it. Um, so that would be you know, a very important thing for organizations if they really value, you know, if, if, if data is the underlying liquid gold, as you said, then managing it, cleaning up, consolidating it, storing it in as, in a, as few places as a repositories as possible is a critical, critical element of being successful. But th thank you again for that. So, but is there a shortcut to success there? It's a, it sounds like it's a tough journey, but you've got to do it. It's, there's, there's no magic wand. The tools are much more advanced now to allow you to understand data, reconcile it, consolidate it, but you still have to do the job. All right. Okay, so can you maybe talk a little bit about whose responsibility is it to drive this forward? So we've got the data silos, you know, you talk about cloud and bringing that to bear as part of anyone's digital transformation journey. Who do you see are the key stakeholders that are really responsible for making that the organization's core strategy? You know, at the heart of it, we see two important constituents. Mm -hmm. Business leaders have to define what outcomes they want to deliver and what they, what customer journeys they're trying to accomplish. Technologies have to then understand that and design their platforms to enable that. It's as simple as that. Right. It's hard to do uh, because, you know, the customer constantly changes what they want. Right. And so you have to be agile in understanding that need and, and being able to change to adapt to it. Mm -hmm. So it's a very specific focus on the customer at the core and building those use cases that are built to that engagement model and that outcome for the customer that we need to focus That's on. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So let, let me, let me touch on one more point. You already talked a little bit about uh, the, the, sort of the legal aspect, compliance, and, and, uh, and, and thus. And I'll, I'll need to quote this in a second and re read this off. But we clearly understand that the legal requirements tend to lag technology by some margin often. So in a recent speech here, Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, noted that the Bank of England's Prudential Rulebook had more than 338,000 words and was longer than War and Peace. So how do we reduce that complexity from a technology perspective without impeding the effectiveness that reg regulators are aiming for? Is, is there a good way to that? So, you know, it's an interesting thing because we, when, when we talk to uh, central banks around the world right. as part of our job, one of the really interesting observations that we've had is that the regulatory rule books are still encoded in, in, in an English language. Right. Um, and it takes a while to translate that into a set of calculations that can run in a bank systems. Those are then in turn generated as a set of documents that are then delivered to a human being at a, at, a financial, at, a, at a central bank. And the rate at which you deliver those documents are largely driven by how quickly 
you have people at the central bank that read that information and understand it. Now, typically, that means by the time the central bank reads that information, the position of the financial institution has significantly evolved because it's a view of the financial institution as of a point in time and not right at that time. If technology can be used, you could do those calculations much more efficiently. You could, for example, translate that rule book into a set of calculations that can be run, and the output of those calculations can in turn be processed by machines that are not meant to replace humans, but to assist humans by calculating the financial risk, for example, the liquidity of a financial institution in much closer to real time. And to us, that's an evolution of where we see some of the capabilities that are now available to be used by financial institutions. But it's fair to say that without a much increased level of automation and an augmented human side to the process, we will not be achieving this. We will stay in this vicious circle of the legal requirements lagging technology. I, I think we've seen lots of movement forward by central banks. Mm -hmm. I, we think that some of them are very forward-leaning in the way they're thinking about it. I think it's a question of how technology, the business environment, and the regulatory uh, regimes come together in a more unified way. Okay, great, thank you. Now, I'd like to use the last couple of minutes just to focus on the future and hear from you based on your experience, based on having not just influenced but driven a lot of innovation over the last quarter of a century, what's next? What can, we, uh, what can we see coming up? What should we focus on for everyone here in the financial sector? What's going to be pertinent and really have an impact? You know, the most important thing when you think of innovation to us is, is imagining the possible and then evolving the technology to enable it. Now, if you just think about the experience that a human being has with a financial institution, there are many steps that have evolved significantly over the last number of years to make things more convenient. But there's still a lot more that can be done. You know, take, for example, speech. Right. Our view is that over time, computers will evolve to become invisible. You know, you don't have to bring out a phone. It, in the old days, you had to power up your computer, open it, go to a, a desk in order to use a computer. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, we see people being able to use a phone, but you still have to tap that application, open it, log in in order to use it. Increasingly, we see computer interfaces becoming transparent. They're always with you. We call that ambient computing. And you could imagine someday that somebody says, I'd like to just move money from my ex to pay someone and not have to log into a system, not have to you know, pass in the security code, none of that. You could have somebody call into a financial institution's contact center and have a software agent assist you and not have to say press one for this, press two for this, but say, how can I help you? And it understands your language uh, because software agents now can speak 40, 50 different languages it can translate it, it can answer your questions. Those are examples, you know, innovation is blending creativity with imagination and understanding how technology can fulfill that purpose. And financial institutions play an enormous role in society, and we believe that the technology that is being invented every day can help them change the way in, they, in which they deliver new experiences for people, and how they can change and empower the economy in new ways. But it's also fair to say what you just described in a few sentences has other elements around AI, automation, and Absolutely. the clouds, Absolutely. just all moving in lockstep to a degree to bring that, uh, that, that interaction that we can then have exactly. in terms of language. Everything I mentioned is powered by uh, you know, data and artificial intelligence and cybersecurity because you have to find, make sure the person talking is really the person, make sure you understand the language, which is artificial intelligence, make sure that the data is clean so you can decide whether the person actually has that much money in order to right. move it, et cetera. So every, every piece of that is empowered by this technology. But we always say innovation comes in identifying a problem, 
imagining an experience, and then using the technology to transform it. So an exciting future ahead for all of us with many changes and new innovations, the disruption and the pace of change won't slow down. Right? It'll be accelerated. Thomas, it's been Thank a great pleasure to have you here on stage. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Yeah,